Warnings remain in place throughout tomorrow. There'll also be further wintry showers, a wintry mix across central and eastern England of rain, sleet and snow, turning more to rain, I fancy, as the day goes on. But certainly over the hills, there could be uh, several centimetres across northern England and northern Scotland. Many western areas having a sunny day on Saturday, but it's going to feel cold wherever you are when you add on that wind. Really cold on Sunday morning with a widespread hard frost. Still some showers draped across eastern England, and there could be some icy conditions here as the showers continue to be wintry. Rain showers for Pembrokeshire and Cornwall. Snow showers in northern Scotland, but many places elsewhere on Sunday will be sunny, but very cold. Canary Islands. Sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Good evening, it's eight o'clock and I'm Alastair Stewart. Coming up tonight, Johnson's tweet of his demands over migrants is dismissed as silly behavior by President Macron. Life and death diplomacy is tonight in a mess. More than 50,000 fail to get their cancers diagnosed. Breast and prostate cancers are the worst. We ask Carol Sikura what needs to be done. And is the BBC impartial? Find out what Ofcom have to say. We'll also look at that controversial documentary about the royal family. All of that coming up, but first, a full news update with Karen Roberts. Thank you, Alistair. These are your latest headlines. The Prime Minister has spoken to South Africa's president about the global challenges to contain the new COVID variant, which has been given the Greek letter Omicron. The UK has imposed strict travel restrictions on six African nations after its discovery. The World Health Organization says the variant carries a higher risk of reinfection and may have a growth advantage. So far, there's been one case in Belgium, but none has been found in Britain. The Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, told MPs the variant may make vaccines less effective. We are concerned that this new variant may pose substantial risk to public health. The variant has an unusually large number of mutations. Yesterday, the UK Health Security Agency classified B11529 as a new variant under investigation, and the variant technical group has designated it as a variant under investigation with very high priority. 
Four teenage boys remain in custody after being arrested on suspicion of murdering a girl in Liverpool. Police say 12-year-old Ava White was stabbed to death in the city centre. A weapon is yet to be recovered. Police are now trawling through hundreds of hours of CCTV footage and have appealed for the public's help. We know that Liverpool was very, very busy at that time. The uh, Christmas light switch on in Church Street had happened shortly before that. So our first appeal really is for any members of the public that may have seen anything of significance and potentially even captured something on their mobile phones to contact police. A man has died after his car was hit by a falling tree in Northern Ireland as Storm Arwen batters the UK. Wind gusts of up to 90 miles per hour have been forecast with the Met Office issuing a red weather warning for parts of North East England and Scotland. Motorists are being urged to stay off the roads and London North Eastern Railway posted a do not travel alert. French fishermen have threatened to continue blocking ports until December the 10th in the ongoing dispute over post-Brexit licences. Fishing crews prevented UK ferries from docking or leaving the port of Saint-Malo before targeting Calais and Oistreham. They also caused disruption at the Channel Tunnel. At least 30 Extinction Rebellion activists have been arrested after blocking roads outside multiple Amazon warehouses around the UK. The climate group says it wants to draw attention to exploitative and environmentally destructive business practices. Amazon says it takes its responsibilities very seriously. You are right up to date. Now, back to Alistair. Karen, thanks. The tragic deaths on Wednesday of 27 people trying to get to the UK by inflatable prompted a flurry of political and diplomatic effort. Something must be done, went up the cry on both sides of the channel. Talk of talks between officials and later with politicians making a late entry to the process initially went well. But when the Prime Minister took to Twitter to share with the nation his master plan and just in time for the first editions of the newspapers, all hell broke loose. To say the French were not amused is to underestimate it at a catastrophic level. Then Boris Johnson wrote a letter to Emmanuel Macron stating the UK's proposals from joint Anglo-French patrols to the beaches of mandatory repatriation, not to Syria or to Iraq, but to France. Now, this would have prompted a fiery debate behind closed doors, but would have got the two sides talking. Not now. Tonight, it has descended into farce. At a press conference earlier this evening, President Macron said, and I quote, I spoke two days ago with Prime Minister Johnson in a serious way. For my part, I continue to do that, as I do with all countries and all leaders. OK, so far so good. But then the bombshell. Quote again, I am surprised, said Macron, by methods when they are not serious. We do not communicate from one leader to another on these issues by tweets and letters that we make public. We are not whistleblowers. Come on, come on. He actually said that twice. Well, a little earlier, those softly, softly talks planned for the weekend also hit a rock. Priti Patel's French opposite number, the Interior Minister Gérald Darmanin, wrote to her, the Home Secretary, saying that the meeting on Sunday would now proceed without British involvement. Pointing the finger of blame squarely at our Prime Minister, he added that he too thought the letter from Boris Johnson to Emmanuel Macron was a disappointment. Making it public made it even worse. The coup de grace came from the mild-mannered Gabriel Attal, French government spokesman, who said the letter from Johnson to Macron was mediocre in terms of content and wholly inappropriate as regards the form. So, tonight, deadlock. Diplomacy is supposed to be war by other means. When cack-handed diplomacy prompts a war, albeit of words, it isn't clever. A cynic might suggest that Boris Johnson knew exactly what he was doing. Blaming French inaction, demanding, post-Brexit, 
what membership of the European Union was supposed to offer selfless cooperation. Offer the French British soldiers on their sovereign territory to show the French gendarmerie how to do it, but guaranteeing all along French rejection. And so back to square one. It is all the French's fault. It was also possibly innocent, maybe even naive. But if Boris Johnson didn't realise that making his tricky list of proposals public would be like waving a red rag to the French bull, then he should have. If he did, and did it anyway for domestic political reasons, it is short-sighted and it is dangerous. Macron, who faces his electorate in May, is also playing silly games to bolster his popularity. So there are few, if any, clean hands in this affair. As to answers, well, we're told that strategically, the solution is to destroy the business model of the people traffickers. Well, good luck with that, given an unending flood of customers and a very replaceable army of organised criminals acting as the providers. I suspect the real solution is to make living in the UK less attractive to those who seek asylum here while their asylum status is being evaluated. But that, I suspect, is true tricky. But you and I both know it's what a lot of the electorate want. What is clear to me is that we do need an urgent return to grown-up diplomacy. We do need cooperation over the policing operation of France's borders. We do need an asylum system that identifies who that offers a safe haven to those who really are in trouble, but deports those who are clearly economic migrants. If we don't, then these people in their thousands will continue to risk all to make a break for it from one safe country to another. If we don't, the French will continue to stand by and watch as people head into perilous waters. So, perhaps a little less posturing and sulking, gentlemen, what your electorates want from both of you is a grown-up solution and pretty damn quick. I'm delighted now to be joined by James Watt, who was a diplomat for 37 years and is the former UK ambassador to Lebanon, Jordan and Egypt. Uh, James, is this naive or a clever gamble by Boris Johnson to make the letter public? Well, I said, first of all, I think you've summed it up very well. And um, I think the point you made at the end is that populations on both sides of the channel want their political leaders to get on and really find a solution. All the more so because it's a humanitarian challenge as well. It's not just a political one. Our lives, our lives are being lost. And I think the question you asked is, you know, was Boris Johnson being naive when he did this? I don't believe so. I don't uh, think anybody, uh, either him or anybody around him, thought that you could do a thing like this uh, and actually make progress. In fact, the opposite is true. You do a thing like this and you shut off uh, a certain avenue of progress. Um, as you said, I think, uh, you know, talks have been going quite well between officials and at uh, sort of ministerial level until suddenly we get this, uh, this kind of torpedo slamming into it. Um, so why? I mean, the question is, why, why would you do this? Clearly, uh, Boris Johnson uh, has got his eye on the domestic audience, just as Emmanuel Macron has. But uh, could, it, could it mean that um, he's concluded, and I'm just speculating, has the Prime Minister concluded that there is no solution to this problem, not in, not in the kind of terms that have been followed by Britain uh, in the last, uh, last uh, you know, few years ever since the Brexit vote? So, in other words, less cooperation with France, more demands on France, less result, yeah. uh, more migrants coming. That's yeah. what's been happening. And there's been a lot of casting around, a lot of blame being cast around in, in British political circles of who's, who's responsible for this. And maybe they've concluded it is impossible, but they don't want to back down and they don't want to be shown to have gone all the way up a blind alley. And so they're somehow doubling down and making it worse. I mean, that's one explanation. I'm not saying that really is true because I haven't spoken to them or heard from them about that. But um, I think that could be it. It's, it's yeah. a deliberate attempt to, to sabotage the present course and to play to that part of the British public, which is all too ready to believe that the French are always out to get us and always out to do their worst. Mm. 
Funnily enough, James, the bit in my monologue, as we call it, that I wrote that caused me the most trials and tribulations as I sat writing, it was exactly that. And I can tell you publicly, it is music to my ears, that there you are, a senior <laughs> former diplomat, saying, do you know what, you might be right. But let me add to that another real, real dilemma for the Prime Minister, uh, and that is to quote something I'm sure you've read as well in the newspapers, and that's Sir John Hayes, Tory uh, Member of Parliament, but importantly, a... Johnson loyalist asking, quotes, if we cannot control our borders, then what was Brexit for? That's getting pretty profound on the domestic political front, isn't it? Yeah, I think that gets, it's very sensitive. It's somehow magnifying the questions around Brexit and how effective it was, or it has been, how complete it is, or isn't. And these are so sensitive for the, for the Tory party and for their, their core voters, that the government, I think, has to run scared of it, scared of it, it seems to be at the moment, anyway. But I think for the rest of us, ordinary, ordinary people, ordinary voters of, ever, of, any, of any persuasion, we simply want a, a proper solution to be found. We want our political leaders to get on and be professional and, you know, entrust, entrust competent people to, to negotiate these delicate matters. But underneath that, there's a much bigger question is, are you really going to um, be inhumane, cruel, illegal, etc.? Uh, breaching human rights and upsetting a lot of people, including your own border, border force, by getting rough with these migrants coming across in boats. Um, the, the numbers are not that huge. We're a country of, I think, about 70 million people. And, OK, it's very annoying that thousands of migrants are coming, despite the fact we're telling them not to. But it is not a national security threat, as some, some commentators have been making out. This is and this is national security threat. I mean, what? How do you how do you classify real security threats like military ones or climate change or, or pandemics or whatever? This is actually very much whipped up. I'm sorry to say, and uh, I think it, if it could be handled calmly with an internal debate in the country, looking at all the factors involved, including giving full weight to the humanitarian ones, and most people in this country want to be humanitarian, want to be humane about how they deal with this problem, not open the doors, obviously, but, but not be brutal, not be illegal, sure. then, you know, that's a way forward. But that's exactly what the latest episode seems to have closed off. Yeah. Final, and a quick one, if I may, James. My, my, when I wrote that and I said that we were going to be having this conversation uh, about these exchanges, an awful lot of people on my Twitter feed said, oh, yeah, the French are just as bad. They've been banging on on Twitter, uh, not least about the fish wars and the licences, as well as this forever and a day. In your 37 years of experience, uh, right at the top as an ambassador as well, have you ever seen diplomacy in such a communications mess? Well, it's certainly not involving Britain. Britain has never done this sort of thing. We just don't do it. We, I thought we didn't do it. it. It was left to rather ramshackle regimes to, to go in for this kind of stuff. Um, trust is the currency of diplomacy. And if you forfeited trust, you deliberately fla flaunted the fact that you're forfeiting trust. It's clear you don't want diplomacy. And if you don't want diplomacy, well, what kind of a state are you and what kind of relationships can other states have with you? It, these, these go fairly deep, these questions as well. It's not just a question of personal style or uh, entertaining a domestic audience. It's a question of the absolute fundamentals. How do states relate, relate to each other if they're not going to um, bring trust to the, to, to the relationship? James, thank you very much indeed. James Watt there, 37 years uh, experience as an ambassador and now working as a political risk consultant giving a credibly well-informed view of the risks that both <laughs> Boris Johnson and Monsieur Macron are currently running at other people's costs. James, good to talk to you. Thanks for breaking into your evening to join us here on GB News. Thank you. So that's the view of a former UK ambassador. I'm delighted to be joined now uh, by Jason Miller, who's a former senior advisor to Donald Trump on foreign affairs. Uh, great to see you there, and thank you for finding time for us. Uh, this row between the UK and France has escalated after the UK government published a letter that Boris Johnson had sent discreetly to the French President Emmanuel Macron. Uh, your man Donald Trump governed by tweet, but does this surprise you for, for the Brits and the French? 
Well, somewhat, Alistair, and I got to say that I'm absolutely heartbroken to hear about the passing of these 27 people who drowned in the channel this week. And I would say that nothing has been learned from what we've seen here in the United States where leadership absolutely comes from the top. What I mean by that is when Joe Biden took the debate stage in the United States this last year, and said that he would grant uh, effectively permanent amnesty or citizenship to 11 million undocumented folks. We saw a surge then at our southern border with Mexico after Biden was elected. I think ultimately leadership is very much from the top down. Yeah. And so until people hear directly from Boris Johnson that the asylum policies are going to be changed, that there's not gonna be the same lax policy in place, we're gonna to continue to see these horrific accidents in the channel because again, people wanna get into the UK. It's one of the greatest countries in the world. Yeah. Former UK Ambassador James Watt was just saying, agreeing with me, that it is just possible that this is one of those undoable policy areas because of much, much bigger issues. But but on the issue of, of, of people crossing borders um, in, in the United States, you went for a wall. We have no such option as, as, as building a wall. So if Boris Johnson picked up the phone to you and said, what would you do? What would your answer be? Well, I would tell them it's a multifaceted approach. Number one, you have to change the uh, asylum policy is in place right now. It has to be very clear that unless you come through the proper channels, you are not going to be allowed to be let into the UK. Clearly, so many of the politicians in the UK right now did not learn from Brexit. The people spoke very clearly and very loudly. Thank goodness we have leaders like Nigel Farage who are continuing to stay vigilant to this. Uh, so you have to change the asylum policy. And second, you can't rely on the French to do anything. You can't rely on some joint maneuvers or joint exercises in the channel. You have to go out there as the UK government and stop these ships from coming in and turn them around. You have to take matters into your own hands. Again, leadership comes from the top. If you're waiting for the French to come in and do something, that's never going to happen. Nobody's trying to turn around and say sneak into other countries, whether it be Mozambique or Honduras. They want to come to the UK. They want to come to the United States of America. These are the greatest countries in the entire world, but leadership has to start from the top. Yeah. Talking of which, um, uh, Donald Trump appears to be flirting with his electorate very slightly. I'll put it to you quite bluntly. Do you reckon he'll run again in 2024? Absolutely. I think President Trump does run. I'm in pretty frequent communication with President Trump, and uh, he has not used the magical words to say that he is running for sure. But if you chat with him for even a couple of moments, it's very clear. And all these crises that Joe Biden has created, uh, the previously mentioned crisis at our southern border, uh, which, again, the Remain in Mexico policy was flipped, the catch and release policy was flipped, and that is a lot of what has led to our surge. But we also have issues, whether it be hyperinflation, the uh, aggression that we're seeing from China, America standing in the world really diminishing, especially as we saw the uh, horrific withdrawal from Afghanistan that was completely bungled uh, from top to bottom. But I do think President Trump comes back. Here's my prediction, though, Alistair. It won't be against Joe Biden. It won't be against Kamala Harris. I think both of their poll numbers are so far in the tank. It's probably against someone like a, a Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, or maybe some other Democratic politician. Yeah, yeah. Um, penultimate question, if I may. Um, I, I actually, it happens, I, I agree with you about Joe Biden uh, running again. Um, uh, I disagree with you about Joe Biden running again. But if he were to, do you think it'll be the James Carville mantra of it's the economy stupid versus uh, Donald Trump's vision of a, a stronger, greater America in the world? So I think where Joe Biden has the problem is he has issues on all fronts. So it's not as though he can play the strong foreign affairs card or the strong domestic policy card. The world is really collapsing around Joe Biden. He's literally at a record low for any presidency at this point that we've seen in our nation's history. And Joe Biden doesn't seem to show any ability to go and turn it around. I think what President Trump is smartly doing is he's not getting too far out in front of it. He's allowing Joe Biden to continue to make the mistakes, but he's also going back and pointing out to people, remember how good we had it with the economy, with the inflation wasn't out of control, the immigration uh, was in check, even with our the gas uh, price crisis that we have right now where we were energy independent and now we're effectively begging OPEC and other countries to go and bail us out. This is why I think President Trump, again, if you talk to him, it's clear that he's going to come back and he'll be back yeah. with a vengeance. So it's the, it's the economy, whoever the players are. Is that the, you're coming to London next month, aren't you? I mean, is that another little indicator that uh, we are close to it being game on? 
Well, I wouldn't necessarily connect the two together, but what we're doing is putting together an event called Counter Conference on December 8th, where we're bringing folks from uh, everywhere from the, the UK to Western Europe to the United States, really as a pushback against this notion of cancel culture and the wokeism that we're seeing all across the world, quite frankly. Uh, that is the one thing I have to say that uh, Emmanuel Macron actually said is, hey, US, do not send us your woke culture. We don't need it. We didn't cause the same problems that you did. But I think with, with so many of these lockdowns and with so many people being concerned that their voices are being eliminated and removed, this is where we start to defend Western civilization. The absolute basic tenet of any democracy is the freedom of speech. And uh, here at Getter and with what we're trying to do with this conference, we want to defend that. Yeah, I'll be in a long line of GB News presenters who'd love to interview you about that, Jason Miller. Uh, look forward to welcoming you uh, live here in the studio uh, for the time being from New York. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Uh, the intriguing views there from the United States of America and before that, uh, the UK former ambassador as well. I hope you found that useful and food for thought. After the break, we'll be talking about the new strain of uh, COVID that's been detected. How worried should we be? That's next. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GB Views at GBNews.UK. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. You won't have missed the news today that a new COVID strain has been discovered. And guess what? There are fears that it could be even more infectious and it could be even more resistant to vaccines. As we wait to see just how dangerous this strain will be, there's been more bad news this week on the health front. Analysis by Macmillan Cancer Support has found that increasing numbers of women are being diagnosed with advanced breast cancer, while the number of men diagnosed with prostate cancer is down by almost 25%. I am delighted to be joined by an old friend of mine and of this programme, Carol Sikura. Uh, the good professor is the former head of the World Health Organization's cancer programme, and there he is. Uh, Carol, great to see you. I'm going to come to the COVID thing in just a moment, if I may. Sure, but first of all, your area of profound expertise, uh, the, the, the cancer concerns. To what extent is this decline in diagnoses a, a function of folk not being able to get to say, see their GP? It's a combination of three things. The first is patient fear, not wanting to get involved in medical care because that is where COVID is. So you don't want to go to any sort of medical facility. So there's fear there with the patients. The second is access to GP, which is it's definitely declined over the last two years. Some of my GP friends criticize me for criticizing them, but it's true. 
And then the third thing is access to the hospital is poorer. The number of scans that can be performed, the number of endoscopies where you put tubes in various parts of the body, they've declined because of COVID precautions. So everything's become much less efficient than it was two years ago. And yes, I was going to ask you about fear. Yeah, I, I was going to ask, I won't now ask you about fear because you've said that uh, as the number one priority, which is something I've thought a lot about and spoken to friends of mine who've been through this process. And one of the things that's pointed out, um, Tracy Crouch, the Tory MP, who I know you know as well, brilliant woman uh, in remission from breast cancer, she bangs on about women getting their mammograms and also checking for lumps and bumps. Um, is that also slowing down? Because that's really crucial in terms of diagnosis, isn't it? You know, it, it's speeded up now. That's not a problem so much now. It was last year, but it's caught up. And the, the breast screening programme, the colon screening programme, goes at full pelt now. The difficulty is processing the patients when they've got an abnormality. Downstream processing, we call it. It sounds like a factory. It sounds like you're making peas in tins or something. But <laughs> it's really important for patients that if they have an abnormality on a screening test, whether it's a mammogram or a PSA test for men with prostate cancer, you can take them up and do something about it. Most of them will have completely harmless problems. They won't have cancer. You've got to detect that early so they can be reassured. And the problem now is everything's just slowed down and we've got to move it along faster. Yeah. And, and final point on that, in terms of prostate cancer, which is a savage, savage killer, it's less easy. I mean, chaps can check themselves for testicular cancer, and I do regularly, uh, in much the same way as women can check their breasts. With, with prostate cancer, it's more tricky, isn't it? It's much more tricky. The PSA test is not a great test. And the problem for men is as you get older, you get symptoms that mimic prostate cancer because the prostate enlarges, it becomes bigger, it's benign and it's of no real concern. But the problem is it's difficult to differentiate between benign prostatic hypertrophy, as it's called, from cancer. And the only way to do that is a PSA and sometimes some sort of MRI, a scan with a biopsy. And that's the only way to pick it up. And it, it is a problem in the time of COVID because facilities are stretched. Yeah. Perfect segue. You're such a professional, Carol Sakura. I was going to ask you next, how concerned are you about the new South Africa variant of COVID? Where we've been already over the last almost two years has put enormous pressure on our hospitals. We know that we're coming into slightly better uplands. Is this going to take us back or is it the government just getting neurotic? Uh, we are going into the uplands, much better uplands. You know, the number of hospital admissions in the last uh, few days have, are dropping every day. The number of people in hospital with COVID is right down compared to what it was. The problem with this variant is we just don't know. And what the minister and all the other politicians are doing is covering their backs in case it's a bad one. They don't know. None of us know. And it's going to take a couple of weeks to know because it's not the number of infections that matter. It's how serious they are. How many people go into hospital if they get the new virus, the, the Omicron virus, as WHO are calling it. And, mm. you know, They've made sensible decisions, trying to reduce the traffic from South Africa. It can't be 100%. People will find ways into this country, as we know. So uh, reduce it as much as possible and see what's going to happen. But monitor the hospitalizations in South Africa and here. The problem in South Africa is that it's younger people. They're much younger than our population. And that means that it may not be so severe there. But when if it comes here, which it probably will, it it cause havoc amongst older people. But, you know, who knows? Will we have Christmas? I think so. I think we'll get Christmas. Yeah. A final point on that. I mean, in the early phases, and you and I have, have talked about it, the government were criticised quite severely uh, of underreacting and Johnson putting off lockdown because the political pressure on him and what ordinary folk felt about it delayed things. Some tonight are now saying you know, to shut the door on flights and this, that and the other. When Sajid Javid himself says, you know, we're doing tests at the moment, we're still trying to find out what's really going on. Have they now shifted into overreaction territory? 
politicians have to be seen to doing things. The worst thing you can do to politicians is say you're not reacting fast enough. So they want to show not only they have the power to do things like stop everything coming into the UK, but also uh, they can do it quickly. And uh, the fact that Belgium has a case that's pretty close to us. It's, 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 there's bound to be cases in the UK because you know people have been travelling until yesterday. I mean, it, it doesn't stop when you say you're going to stop the flights. It's uh, you know at midnight tonight or four o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. Uh, you know it makes no sense. The virus doesn't care for timelines. People have come with it. If it's here, it's here, and we have to live with it. There's, so far, there is no evidence it causes a more severe disease, and that, that's the reason for being hopeful. Carol Secura, always good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for finding time for us uh, this evening. That's Professor Carol Secura, the oncologist, cancer expert, but also uh, giving his views on Catch-22 for the politicians. And don't forget what he said at the very beginning of that conversation on the cancer theme. Do do those personal tests, but be realistic. If you do find you've got something to worry about, it may be tricky still to get in touch with a GP, but that's what you need to do. It saves lives. Now, Ofcom, the Office of Communications Regulation, to give it its proper name, released its annual report on included a section on the BBC this week. It revealed that complaints about the corporation have more than trebled in the last three years. But more tellingly, it said impartiality is a complex challenge for the BBC. A complex challenge. I'm joined now by Brendan O'Neill, who is the chief political writer for Spiked. A complex challenge. The rules are crystal clear. They must be politically impartial. We have licence from Ofcom here to vary our debates and vary our arguments and balance them over all the schedule, but the BBC must be impartial. How on earth can it be deemed as being a tricky, complex question? Well, that's the issue. And you yeah. do wonder why they think it's so tricky and so complex to be impartial. Most people would think that's a fairly simple thing to achieve. You just make sure that you report everything objectively and neutrally. You don't take political sides. You reprimand your members of staff when they go off, uh, go off neutrality and start saying things that could be interpreted as having a political bias. It seems quite straightforward to most of us in terms of how you maintain that impartiality. But I think the confusion at the BBC and also in, in parts of Ofcom is precisely because the BBC has gone slightly off the impartiality road in recent years, and it has become over-politicised, in my view, and it's going to probably be quite difficult for it, for it to get back on track. Mm. But, but the extraordinary thing, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not suddenly jumping on a bandwagon because I've written about this myself in The Spectator and elsewhere, I've always felt very, very strongly about it, but the BBC, in response to the Ofcom report, say that more people consider them to be more impartial than anybody else. And to be fair, they certainly get the biggest news audiences. Yeah, and but I, I, I saw that and I thought that was a bit of a strange boast coming from people at the BBC because they shouldn't just be more impartial than other news outlets. They should be the at the pinnacle of impartiality because, uh, as you know, you've written about these things extensively. This is the public broadcaster. This is the broadcaster that it is that is supposed to represent the public and is supposed to speak to the public. And I fear what has happened to the BBC in recent years, it's been colonised by a very certain section of society, people who have a particular view on the culture war, people who have a particular view on Brexit in particular. We saw the BBC essentially became the Brexit bashing corporation for a few years. And I think it, it went wrong. It went wrong for a few years and it has to get back on track. But I think the mm. question it's probably asking itself now is how does it do that without alienating those people who have warmed to the BBC precisely because they think it's taking the right war at the right side in the culture war and the right side politically. And I think that's where the confusion sets in. How does the BBC please all people by being as impartial as it can possibly be.
Yeah, a, a fascinating point. I mean, the, the, I, and I think you agree on this. I, I was one of many who thought the appointment of Tim Davey and particularly what he said on appointment as the new Director General was, was a breath of fresh air. And then Richard Sambrook uh, himself, a former very senior editorial figure, coming out and saying, look, you guys have got to be so careful about what you say on social media, this, that and the other. And to be fair, the BBC does occasionally read the riot act to their people. Yeah. Uh, but, but to me, it just doesn't seem to have any serious impact upon them. Is Davey facing an internal power struggle that he's losing? I think he is, actually. And I think there are, um, you know, big hitting broadcasters at the BBC who are kind of pushing their luck a little bit and seeing how much they can get away with. I mean, the famous case is, is Emily Maitlis, who on a few occasions did use Newsnight almost as a political platform. I don't want to single Emily Maitlis out, but it was a good example of the problem. And of course, lots of the supporters of the BBC and of Emily Maitlis said, well, she's just giving her view. But you're not supposed to do that if you work for the BBC. If you want to give your view, you should work for a newspaper or you should go to GB News. You should go to one of the outlets that are not so strictly regulated in terms of impartiality. The thing is that the public broadcaster should speak to the public. And that is a lot of people, a lot of opinions, a lot of intellectual diversity. And the BBC, I think, has become a bit intellectually conformist, very politically narrow, and it seems to get all its people from the same strata of society. So it's not speaking to the nation, and that's the problem it's got to resolve. Interestingly, you mentioned um, Emily and, and, and Newsnight there. Um, there are a couple of really important tests coming up for the BBC. The appointment of a new editor of Newsnight, as yep. Esme uh, Wren moves on to Channel 4 News, but also with the departure of Laura Koonsberg, a new political editor. Two absolutely vital appointments, one in news and one in current affairs. Uh, will Davey have any sway in that? Well, it's hard to tell. I think he probably will want to. And I, as you say, these are incredibly important appointments appointments. They would be at any time, but I think they're, they're especially important now because all eyes are on the BBC to see if it can renew its commitment to impartiality and if it can become a proper public broadcaster, especially after the Brexit years, after all the problems with culture war issues. You know, the BBC has put out stuff on white privilege and the importance of certain trans issues and gender fluidity and the sorts of issues that alienate, I would say, large mm. sections of the public. Mm. So I think these new appointments are really going to be about whether the BBC can find someone who has a broad enough view to speak to the widest population in the country. And I think they're going to struggle to do that. I would think that a lot of the political reporters and up and coming editors at the BBC probably have a particular political viewpoint that might run counter to the viewpoint of many people out there. So it's a tough task the BBC has going ahead, and I think we have to wait and see if they succeed. Yeah. I interviewed John Whittingdale when he was Culture Secretary at the Edinburgh Festival several years ago, where he, in that classic John Whittingdale way, laid out gentle warnings and reminded the licence fee came around. Nadine Doris, the current Culture Secretary, has come in like somebody entering the OK Corral. But, here's the question, do you think she means it? It's hard to tell with Nadine Doris. I think she's, I think she could be a very interesting culture secretary. She's got lots of good ideas. I think she's right about cancel culture. She's right about the problem of uh, shutting down discussion, discussion, shutting down debate. She's got some good instincts on those issues. But whether she can really fight a proper war or a proper conflict with the BBC, that remains to be seen. It could be a conflict that both sides lose. That's the problem. And I think the, the preferable outcome is that the BBC gets its own house in order and doesn't need that kind of uh, political intervention from on high. But that will involve the BBC having a serious reckoning with itself, thinking very seriously about where it's gone wrong, thinking about why millions of people don't think it is uh, impartial enough, I don't think its comedy is very good because it seems to be constantly taking the mick out of ordinary people and Brexit voters and everything else and wonders why the BBC takes the political positions that it does. So uh, Nadine Doris versus the BBC, let's see how that pans out. But I hope the BBC takes action first and really gets back on the right track. Fascinating, all of that being the, the political world and the BBC and political impartiality. 
To manage to pick a fight with the Duke of Cambridge and lose it is quite a triumph. What did you make of Amal Rajan's documentary, The Princes and the Press? I thought it was pretty good. Now, this is one issue on which I will defend the BBC, because I, I thought that the royal family were slightly throwing their weight around, and it did come off like a bit of a temper tantrum. And it did remind me, I've, I've been watching The Crown on Netflix, as I'm sure many other people have too, and it did remind me of the how the royals used to behave in the 1950s, right through to the 1960s, when they would punish the media if the media said anything about them that was uh, critical or sceptical or in any way demeaning as they saw it. And I, th so this is reminding me of that. It's like the royal saying, well, we're going to boycott you. We're going to punish you if you don't tell the story in the way that we would like you to tell it. So in this instance, I think the BBC was right to stand up to the palace. I think the royal family needs to back down and not appear to be intervening too much into the freedom of the media. Mm. The final point on that, though, and, and I again, I put my cards on the table. I'm a, a huge admirer of Amal Rajan as, as a broadcaster. Um, and I, I remember when he was editing newspapers as well. He's an incredibly bright guy, incredibly hardworking. Um, but here's the question. Whoever commissioned this piece of work at the BBC, I mean, Amal may have pitched for it and they said, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Or, or, or they said, right, Amal's the guy to do it. He's... A very, very senior Today radio presenter and media editor and the rest of it. And he is on record in print as being a Republican, someone who is opposed to the royal family. A position I don't share, but a position which in the great democracy that we live in we're entitled to hold. But for the BBC to say to someone who is on record a Republican and anti-monarchist, go make the programme, seemed to me, shall we say, at best inept. Uh, well, I'm a fan of uh, Amal Rajan, too. He, he actually started off as an intern at Spike, so we've been following his career with keen interest. Um, yes, you're right. You know, there, there, there's always going to be this tussle at the BBC, because what the people there have to do, fundamentally, is kind of hide their political views and try to suppress them as much as possible, so that in their day-to-day -day job of informing the public or entertaining the public, they can be as neutral and as uh, objective as possible. And I'm sure they fail on that, as we've just been talking about. They fail at that a lot. I think Amal Rajan is a trustworthy enough broadcaster to be able to make a documentary like this without allowing his republicanism to take over. But I think in this battle, the, the fundamental question has now become, should the BBC do as the royal family tells it to do? And I think that takes it to a whole other level. And that's when we have to start asking not only what are the problems in the BBC, of which there are many, but also shouldn't broadcasters have that freedom to investigate stories and tell stories yeah, without feeling pressure from powerful people? And that's yeah. an important question too. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Uh, fascinating conversation and nicely balanced all the way through. Credit where it is due and, and brickbats where they are equally due. Brendan O'Neill, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Brendan O'Neill, the editor of Spike. After the break, we'll tell you about the man who got his first job by handing out his CV outside a tube station. I love it. Stay with us. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. 
we have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. There's a warning this evening from a group of charities uh, who, sorry, I do beg your pardon, it slipped, who say that tens of thousands of vulnerable people are struggling to get their COVID booster jabs. A survey has found that people with rheumatic conditions are having difficulty accessing a third dose of the vaccine. I'm joined now by Sue Farrington, who's the chief executive of the Schleroderma and Reynos UK and is also the chair of the Rare Autoimmune Rheumatic Disease Alliance, who are behind this survey. I hope I got the first two bits of it right, did I? Scleroderma, it's a difficult word to say. It, absolutely, well, I'm, it, but equally, therefore, it's important that we get it right. So thank you. We're talking here about rheumatics and we're talking about skin uh, difficulties. So who particularly then and how many are affected by this shortage or this lack of information? So we're concerned that there are many people with autoimmune conditions whose treatment um, kind of suppresses their immune system, and they are still at increased risk from COVID-19. I think two years in, we know much more about the impact of COVID-19, and we know that when you've got a weakened immune system, you are at greater risk of contracting COVID-19 and suffering re really serious complications. But also recent research from doctors Rutter, Lanyon and Pierce at Nottingham University has shown that you are twice as likely mm. to die from COVID-19 um, as when you compare that to the um, general population. Sure. But the so other that's... thing that we do know yeah, is that actually when you have a, a weakened immune system and you're taking certain medication, when it comes to the vaccine, people have not been mounting as effective a response. So they're not producing the number of antibodies or the greater level of antibodies that's needed to provide protection. Oh, fascinating. So, and, and has that, as it were, word gone round amongst the community? Because when I was reading up ahead of having this conversation, my understanding was it was predominantly they were having difficulty with, with, the, with the authorities getting in touch with them. And then if they did get in touch, trying to make a booking and then finding it difficult to get through the booster system and what have you. But you're saying there is concern within that community of folk that actually this doesn't do them much good and, and, and can cause them some harm. So, which is why this third dose and the booster is so important. And we yeah. were really pleased when the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation recognised the challenges of this um, community and said, right, a third dose is really necessary. And the third dose is to be followed by a booster dose in four to six months. Now, this is where the problem has occurred because we've got two um, conversations going. One is about the third dose and one is about the booster. And I think once it's gone down to a local level, there's a lot of confusion with healthcare professionals who think that the third dose is the booster, yeah. and it's not. It's a third dose together with a booster in four to six months' time. So people with autoimmune conditions will have four doses of the vaccine, mm. and that's to see if they can ramp up the antibody response. Sure. But it seems to me, as it were, by way of conclusion, uh, that the, the logistics of, of getting vulnerable person to jab centre and giving them information, that's pretty straightforward. That's logistical. That, they just need to get their finger out and do that. But the medical concerns about the impact, the, we read this stuff the whole time about the whole vaccination programme. There is a minority of people who do have negative responses and then very loud voices who say, therefore, don't touch it at all. But in, in the case of the folk that you represent and speak for, 
This is real and it's a tangible number. Yes, it's real. It is hundreds of thousands of people whose lives are affected. And if they don't get this third dose and the booster dose, then they are at risk of contracting COVID-19 and potentially dying as a result of it. And we've got far greater research now to um, evidence this. Um, it is a reality for hundreds of thousands of people. Um, there are there are a number of problems. I think the communication with healthcare profession, professionals at the local level needs to be yep. improved. There's a lot of confusion. Um, GPs aren't understanding that there is a third dose. There's also been confusion as to who will dis, who will um, alert those who have uh, these autoimmune conditions. Is it secondary care or is it GPs? Yep. Um, and I think there's a third issue, it, that the system cannot record a third dose. And we are concerned that if it doesn't record a third dose and it records it as a booster, that when people come round to requiring their booster dose, there will be qu questions and queries about, well, you, you've had your booster, you don't yeah. need another one. Sue, we have to um, leave it so there, but you, you could not have been clearer. I apologise for interrupting there, Sue Farrington. Thank you very much indeed. Message received, and we will keep an eye on that because it is complex, but it is really important for, as you say, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your time, and, and thanks for what you're doing to help folk as well. Thank you. That's Sue Farrington there. And finally, as they say, if you were looking for work, what would you do? Scour the internet and the local newspaper for job adverts. Send your CV off to companies in the hope of getting an interview. Well, Haider Malik went one step further. After getting a first-class degree in banking and finance last year, but struggling to find a job, the 24-year-old stood outside Canary Wharf tube station and handed out his CV to passers-by. Within three hours, he had an interview... And just a few days later, he'd got a job. Well, one man who knows all about using your initiative to find work is the former Apprentice star, Tom Skinner. And I'm delighted to say, hot foot from the racing, <laughs> which, we which we both love. Uh, he has joined me now. Imagine if that had been a challenge in The Apprentice. How clever is this guy? Fantastic. He's used his loaf. He's fought outside the box. Listen, when people are looking for jobs, they send an email with a CV, they go back of the poll, they've got to wait to read it, can take weeks and weeks and weeks, and companies get hundreds of emails, yeah? yeah? The interesting thing he also said, though, and it's very much a covid -y thing, yeah. he couldn't get himself across on Zoom, yeah. face to face. I mean, you walk into an office for an interview, ah, they're going to be bold. <laughs> but this guy's clearly bright as a button, everything to offer, but he couldn't crack it on Zoom. Yeah, but, but look... I think what he's done is fan I want to buy him a beer. I'd give him a job tomorrow. He's fantastic. That little QR code, because thousands of people walk out the station, they're going to sink and think, what's going on here? Boom, on their phone, gets up his CV, and I'm, well, I'm not surprised that he got a job that quickly. In fact, it's fantastic, mm. and it's just really, really clever. I mean, we actually do it on our mattresses. We put QR codes in the hotels we supply on the labels. So if someone stays in the mattress and they like the sleep, they go, bosh. Go I'd straight to the website and I'll buy one. About bo not, not bish bash bosh. Bish bash just, just bosh 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 that's it. Absolutely. <laughs> As you imply there, you obviously run a business, you've yeah. been running businesses off yeah. and on for, for a period of time. What are the two key qualities that you look for in a man or a woman who comes along and says, I want, I want to answer the application, I want to answer the advert to be your new ex? Someone that I, I believe in loyalty, someone that's loyal, that says that if they say they're going to do something, they do it. That's, that's for number one is for me. I love that. Um, and the second biggest thing is someone that can enjoy the job and bring something to the table that I haven't already got. That's a really big factor for me. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that struck me reading up on, 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 uh, on this guy, Haider, is, is that he actually did something that I hadn't seen anybody yeah. else ever do. It's fantastic. Honestly, that's a, look. Thumbs up to the man. He's done a fantastic job and I wish him the best of luck in his new career because what he's done, now he's done and it's worked, isn't it? Yeah. And, and if you do make a success of it, as you have, then, then you can afford to go to the races and you can afford to lose a bit of money. <laughs> We've we done all right today. Lost the cattle, but won it back in the last race. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the, the mattress business is the main business or That's one it. of? No, so the main business is Bosch Beds. Uh, we manufacture mattresses and beds and pillows all in the UK, using UK materials. But are you the kind of guy who think, right, I'll monetize that now and move on to the next challenge? No, or you love the business no, I'm and build, build it, build, and build it? I'll be number one in the UK over the next two years, 100%. I'm going to keep grafting that, keep working at it. 
there and uh, looking forward to see what happens. And it's a fascinating product that's advertised on telly all over the place. Big market in mattresses. It's huge. What people don't realise with mattresses is, when you go to these big, these big major retailers, they've got these huge warehouses, these big... Next costs. time. Run oh, out of no. time. Oh, oh, no. No. Otherwise, no, no. <laughs> God, thank you. Otherwise, thank Mark you Dolan will break my legs because he is up <laughs> tonight. From Tom, from me and from all of our guests, thanks for joining us and a very good night to you. Here's the weather. It's time to remind ourselves... There's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello. Storm Arwen is hitting parts of the UK this evening and hitting it hard. A red weather warning from the Met Office is rare and we've issued this one tonight because Storm Arwen heads south through the North Sea. The winds are getting particularly dangerous across the northeastern corner of the UK. But everywhere seeing the winds picking up through the night and remaining very windy during Saturday. The red warning covers the coastal strip of eastern Scotland into northeast England, where gusts of 90 miles an hour are likely to cause structural damage and provide dangerous, dangerous waves. There are also amber warnings across the northeast, but also Wales and the southwest, where gusts of 75 miles an hour are likely. And we also, on top of all the wind warnings, have some snow warnings as the weather turns more wintry down the spine of the UK. But it's really the winds this evening causing the damage down the eastern side of Scotland into northeast England. Dangerous waves, as I said, the likely a hood of uh, significant impacts across the travel network, but also power problems too. This zone of wet weather pushes southwards with a mixture of rain, sleet and some snow, so you could wake up to a covering on Saturday morning. The winds, though, will still be very lively and potentially dangerous through much of Saturday. So warnings remain in place throughout tomorrow. There will also be further wintry showers, a wintry mix across central and eastern England of rain, sleet and snow. Turning more to rain, I fancy, as the day goes on. But certainly over the hills, there could be uh, several centimetres across northern England and northern Scotland. Many western areas having a sunny day on Saturday, but it's going to feel cold wherever you are when you add on that wind. Really cold on Sunday morning with a widespread hard frost. Still some showers draped across eastern England, and there could be some icy conditions here as the showers continue to be wintry. Rain showers for Pembrokeshire and Cornwall. Snow showers in northern Scotland, but many places elsewhere on Sunday will be sunny, but very cold.